It's Tuesday, May 7th. I'm Priyanka Arabindi. And I'm Trayvell Anderson. And this is What A Day, where we respect the local journalists in Nantucket who spent an entire day following around the first cyber truck on the island and bullying it viciously when it got stuck in the sand. It is a tiny island full of haters, and I have never felt the need to move <laughs> as badly as I do right now. An island of people doing the Lord's work. We should join them. <laughs> On today's show, Columbia University cancels its main commencement ceremony after weeks of protests. Plus, Indiana primaries are today, and we take a look at key races. But first, there are renewed hopes for a ceasefire agreement between Israel and Hamas. On Monday, Hamas announced that it had accepted a ceasefire proposal advanced by Qatari and Egyptian mediators. It reportedly includes a phased release of some Israeli hostages who are being held by Hamas in Gaza and a gradual withdrawal of Israeli troops from the region, ending with, quote, sustainable calm or permanent cessation of military and hostile operations. The announcement was a surprise after a delegation for Hamas left the negotiating table in Cairo on Sunday amid an impasse over how long a potential truce would last. Israeli officials said later on Monday that while the proposal Hamas agreed to didn't meet all of their demands, it would send a group to continue talks in hopes of reaching a deal. Okay, so that sounds like good news. It's definitely promising, but it also didn't stop Israel from ramping up attacks on Rafah in southern Gaza. They started on Sunday night and continued Monday after Hamas's militant arm launched a rocket attack on a major aid crossing between southern Gaza and Israel that killed four soldiers. At least a dozen Palestinians died in Israeli counterstrikes on Sunday night. Israel on Monday also ordered more than 100,000 people to leave eastern Rafah and move north of the city. But it's not clear yet whether that means a larger ground invasion is imminent. To get a sense of what an invasion of Rafah would mean for the people sheltering there and for Gaza as a whole, I spoke earlier with Jeremy Kaneindyke. He is the president of Refugees International, a humanitarian organization that advocates for refugees and policies that help them. He also served in senior roles at the U.S. Agency for International Development, or USAID, first as the director of USAID's Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance under former President Barack Obama, and then as the agency's lead official for COVID-19 under President Joe Biden. Here is our conversation. Over a million people are currently sheltering in Rafah, roughly half the population of Gaza. And it's the only major city in the region that hasn't seen a full Israeli ground invasion yet. How vital is Rafah right now as a place for civilians and refugees who are trying to survive this war? So Rafah is really vital both because it is the last bastion of some form of safety and protection for about half of Gaza's population, as you said, but also because it is the one remaining hub for the aid operation in Gaza. Aid groups do not have any consistent access through the rest of Gaza. They are very dependent on permission from the IDF. There are a lot of movement restrictions. They don't have consistent access to border crossings outside of the south. And so most of the aid flow is also through Rafah, through those southern border crossings. That's where most of the humanitarian residences are, where most of the warehouses are, where most of the trucking capacity is. So if that goes offline, it will hugely handicap, even collapse the humanitarian effort at a time when, of course, as the executive director of the World Food Program said over the weekend, famine is already present in the north and is spreading south. On Monday, Israel ordered about 100,000 people who are sheltering in eastern Rafah to evacuate to an area that is north of the city, an area that Israel says is a humanitarian zone. What new immediate challenges will those evacuees face? Those evacuees face a lot of uncertainty and not much guarantee of safety. Um, you know, we've seen over and over that these evacuation orders do not actually confer safety. Um, there was a very famous, widely reported incident a few months ago where a young girl named, named Hind was with her family evacuating in a part of northern Gaza after an evacuation order from the IDF had told them to move out of their neighborhood. While they were in their car driving out of their neighborhood, their car was targeted by Israeli forces. It was blown up. She had a cell phone. She called you know, the emergency line for the Palestinian Red Crescent. That audio has been widely shared. The Palestinian Red Crescent conferred with the IDF. 
sent a team out with IDF approval to go and rescue her. They too were targeted and killed by the IDF, and it wasn't until days later that other paramedics were finally able to find them. So I think these kind of orders are rightly viewed with a lot of skepticism by Palestinians in Gaza. But then, of course, the so-called safe zone in Mwasi that the IDF is telling people to move towards That too has been struck numerous times and CNN and NBC have done extensive exposés showing how that zone has not actually been immune to strikes. So there's really nowhere safe for people to go and it's very confusing and very uncertain for Palestinians right now to know what they can do to find safety. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has repeatedly said that the IDF will invade Rafah. In fact, we've already seen attacks Sunday and Monday. So if more people are forced to evacuate the city ahead of a wider invasion, what will the fallout be for people, you know, more widely in Gaza? It will really be catastrophic. And I think even the Biden administration, while they haven't said as definitively as I wish they would that there should be no Rafa invasion, you know, what they have said is there should be no Rafa invasion without a credible plan to protect the civilian population. So even that, you know, in a backhanded way, acknowledges how damaging a full offensive would be. What I wish they would acknowledge, and what I think, frankly, they need to acknowledge, is there is no safe way to evacuate a million people from Rafa. That is not something that, as a logistical matter, can be done safely. And given the track record of the IDF with past evacuation orders and with their their reckless targeting that even the president has called indiscriminate, there's really no way to see any evacuation plan coming from the IDF at this point as a credible plan. Right. And I mean, without this plan, aid organizations are already struggling to operate in Gaza. How would an invasion at this point exacerbate the challenges that these groups are already facing on the ground? Well, the expectation from a lot of the humanitarian groups is it would basically shut down most of their operations. You know, the crossing at Rafah and the crossing nearby in the south at Karem Shalom, those have been the principal entry points for humanitarian aid into Gaza since the start of the war. None of the other crossings have the same volume, have the same logistical pipelines. So if those two are taken offline, it really risks the full collapse of the aid effort. Now, I think the Biden administration is pinning a lot of hopes on this new port that they are building in central Gaza that may or may not prove useful, But it is certainly not a replacement for losing the two principal crossings where most of the aid currently flows. So you served in senior positions at USAID under Presidents Barack Obama and Joe Biden. What do you think the conversations from an aid perspective at least look like within the Biden administration at this moment? How would they be preparing for the fallout of a Rafa invasion? (sighs) I think there is a huge amount of frustration in the working levels of the government right now about U.S. policy. You can see that in what's been reported about what USAID and the State Department sent up the chain. And they are also sending up the chain their view that there is no way to soften the blow of a Rafa invasion. There is no way to offset the humanitarian catastrophe that that would entail. So, you know, how do you plan for a catastrophe that you can see coming and that you know you can't offset. You can't do it. I think an interesting analog here and something that Brett McGurk, who's now on a senior level in the White House, worked on in the Obama administration was the invasion of the town of Mosul in Iraq. And there, there was extensive care taken and close coordination between aid providers and the military to provide safe exit zones for people, to make sure that there was extensive aid access in all of the areas that were you know, liberated from ISIL control. So there was a robust aid presence. There was a real plan that was being generated in consultation and coordination with humanitarian groups in order to do as much as possible to mitigate the humanitarian impact. Nothing close to that is happening here. The last thing I would say is, you know, the famine has disappeared a bit from the headlines in the last couple of weeks. Critical to understand about famine is to fight a famine, you need access and you need safety for aid workers. You cannot fight famine off the back of a truck. So I have fought famines and severe food crises during my time in the U.S. government, and the mission critical element there is presence. You need aid workers who can be present on the ground, who can be operating nutrition centers, who can be operating health centers, who can be rebuilding and restoring water services. All of that 
requires safe access and presence. And it's very hard to see any of that being possible right now without a ceasefire. So if a ceasefire does not come together, and particularly if the Rafa invasion goes forward, it doesn't just devastate the million people who are sheltering in Rafa. It really devastates the entire population of Gaza because it would virtually guarantee that the famine will spread throughout the entire territory. That was my conversation with Jeremy Kneindyke, president of Refugees International. That is the latest for now. We'll get to some headlines in just a moment, but if you like our show, please make sure to subscribe and share it with your friends. We'll be back right after some ads. What a day is brought to you by Zbiotics. Let me tell you, if there's a surefire way to wake up feeling fresh after a night of drinking, it's with Zbiotics. Zbiotics pre-alcohol probiotic drink is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. Just remember to make Zbiotics your first drink of the night, drink responsibly, and you'll feel your best tomorrow. Yes, get the most out of your pre-summer plans by stocking up on pre-alcohol now. Go to zbiotics.com slash wad to get 15% off your first order when you use wad at checkout. Zbiotics is backed with a 100% money back guarantee. Oh. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash wad and use the code wad at checkout for 15% off. Thank you, Zbiotics, for sponsoring this episode and our good times. What a day is brought to you by Fast Growing Trees. Fast Growing Trees is the biggest online nursery in the U.S. with more than 10,000 different kinds of plants and over 2 million happy customers. They have everything you could possibly want, like fruit trees, palm trees, evergreens, house plants, and so much more. Plus, Fast Growing Trees makes it easy to order online and your plants are shipped directly to your door in one to two days. And along with their 30-day Alive and Thrive guarantee, they offer free plant consultation forever. We love fast-growing trees here. I keep telling you that the many plants that I've gotten from these folks are yet hanging on. Um, and that's not because I have a green thumb, okay? This spring, fast-growing trees, they have the best deals online, up to half off on select plants and other deals. And listeners to our show get an additional 15% off their first purchase when using the code WAD at checkout. That's an additional 15% off at fastgrowingtrees.com using the code WAD at checkout. Fastgrowingtrees.com, code WAD. Offer is valid for a limited time. Terms and conditions may apply. What it is brought to you by Aura Frames. Aura Frames are beautiful Wi-Fi connected digital picture frames that allow you to share and display unlimited photos. From grandmothers to new mothers, aunts, and even the friends in your life, everyone loves an Aura Frame. Aura Frames are guaranteed to bring joy to loved ones of all ages. My grandmother literally just texted me Juanita uh, <laughs> to tell me what she wants for Mother's Day. Um, she does not know she about to get an aura frame, okay? Bless. <laughs> okay, because, okay, they're, they're the perfect gift. I can just update the photos and upload them for her. That way we don't have to have too much back and forth. You know what I mean? She'll know I'm still alive, but I won't actually have to necessarily reach out. You know? Oh, yes. Proof. It's amazing, y'all, for everybody. Okay? Right now, Aura has a great deal for Mother's Day. Listeners can save on the perfect gift by visiting AuraFrames.com to get $30 off plus free shipping on their best-selling frame. That's A-U-R-A Frames.com. Use code WAD at checkout to save. Terms and conditions apply. Let's get to some headlines. Headlines. Week three of Trump's hush money trial started off how you'd expect, with Justice Juan Mershon issuing Trump yet another $1,000 fine for violating his gag order on Monday. As with all the others, this order bars Trump from attacking those involved in the trial. Mershon warned Trump that any future violations could potentially result in jail time. And yes, this is the 10th time that Trump has violated his gag order. I wonder if he hits a certain number of fines, he gets one free like a Pizza Hut deal. <laughs> 
Last week, the former president was fined $9,000 for social media posts. Outside of the courtroom Monday, Trump remarked that honoring his constitutional right to free speech was worth a trip to jail. And frankly, you know what? Our constitution is much more important than jail. It's not even close. I'll do that sacrifice any day. Oh, my God. Indiana's primary election is today. President Biden is running uncontested in the Democratic presidential primary. Former President Donald Trump and former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley will appear on the GOP ticket. Among the important races down the ballot is the race to replace the state's GOP governor, Eric Holcomb. Holcomb is at the end of his term limit, and several conservatives have thrown their hat into the ring. In another race, Republican Senator Mike Braun is expected to win his party's nomination after receiving Trump's endorsement. Meanwhile, Republicans are hoping to fill the state's four open seats in the House of Representatives. And half of the seats in the state legislature are up for grabs. So for all of our Hoosiers out there, please do not forget to vote. Do not forget to text your friends, family, whoever who live in Indiana to get out there and vote. Mm -hmm. It's important. Columbia University has canceled its main commencement ceremony. The university announced Monday that it will not hold the university-wide graduation, but will still hold ceremonies for the individual colleges. The university's spokesperson said, quote, holding a large commencement ceremony on our campus presented security concerns that unfortunately proved insurmountable. This comes after the New York Police Department deployed more than 100 officers onto campus last week for a second time to arrest students occupying a building on campus and break down a pro-Palestinian encampment. The raid ended the weeks-long protests against the war in Gaza. Graduation was scheduled for May 15th. Columbia says it is looking at alternative events to celebrate its graduates, many of whom did not have high school graduations because of COVID-19. Condé Nast, the parent company of major culture publications like Vogue, GQ, and Vanity Fair, reached a tentative labor agreement with its unionized workers on Monday. After over a year of negotiations, staffers have won higher wages, increased parental leave, and better health care. The deal came just hours before this year's Met Gala. Staffers had planned to picket the event if their demands were not met before celebrities were set to walk the carpet, a move that would have been really not a good look for the most prestigious fashion event of the year. We love it when corporations are forced to do the right thing, when there is the potential for bad optics. This is a great strategy. Everybody, please learn from this. (laughs) But let's get into the fashion of the night. The theme was the Garden of Time. I have thoughts on this year's Met Gala. Nothing was really like my favorite, favorite ever. But a couple stood out to me. I did like Tyla in the sand dress. That was cool. Mm-hmm. Kim Kardashian unfortunately brought it. She was in Margella. She looked amazing. Mm-hmm. But Trayvall, I know you have some favorites too. What are we liking? So I should say the carpet is still going as we go to record. True. Some new fashion might pop up that all the girls are talking about. My faves right now, though, are Janelle Monet looked wonderful. Yep. Zendaya looked wonderful. I want to shout out Kiki Palmer. Yes. She was giving me Vanessa. Isabel Calloway in Coming to America. For those who know that reference, shout out to you. And then last but not least, Cardi B giving us black hole couture on the Met Gala red carpet. I kind of loved it. I have to go through and listen to her explanation of like how this is Garden of Time, but like Mm -hmm. I'm here for it. I'm interested. She got us talking. (laughs) It doesn't, does it matter? Probably not. And those are the headlines. That is all for today. If you like the show, make sure you subscribe, leave a review, find Trump another thousand dollars for running his mouth and tell your friends to listen. And if you're into reading and not just articles bullying cyber trucks like me, What A Day is also a nightly newsletter. Check it out and subscribe at crooked.com slash subscribe. I'm Trey Bell Anderson. I'm Priyanka Arabindi. And, and there's, there's still, still time, time to, invite to invite us, us to, to the, the Met, Met Gala. Gala. I'm like... Not that far away. I mean, you could just crash right now. I hop in an Uber. (laughs) Big Monday night plans involve finishing up work and crashing the Met Gala. (laughs) Isn't that like a whole plot of like an Oceans movie? (laughs) Yeah. They crash it it and they steal a diamond necklace. Anne Hathaway, Mm -hmm. Rihanna, it's all of them. It's so good. What a Day is a production of Crooked Media. It's recorded and mixed by Bill Lance. Our associate producers are Raven Yamamoto and Natalie Bettendorf. We had production help today from Michelle Alloy, Greg Walters, and Julia Clare. Our showrunner is Erica Morrison, and our executive producer is Adrian Hill. Our theme music is by Colin Gilliard and Kashaka.
Well, today is brought to you by Books. This Mother's Day, give mom her flowers. She absolutely deserves the best. And that's why you should send her farm fresh flowers from Books. That's short for bouquets. Books has modern designs and unique flowers you can't find anywhere else. And with 20% off, you can send some to mom, your wife, your auntie, even your granny, okay? Anyone who deserves flowers in your life Mm -hmm. doesn't have to be holiday specific you get flowers you're getting flowers (laughs) everyone's getting flowers (laughs) go to books.com and use promo code wad for 25 percent off that is b-o-u-q-s.com promo code wad books promo code wad What a Day is brought to you by Ulta Beauty. This AAPI Heritage Month, Ulta Beauty is celebrating the joy of belonging, belonging to a community composed of intricate connections, belonging to our past and our future, to the heritage and birthright that is beauty. Ulta Beauty shines a light on the AAPI community, passing the mic to brand founders and creators to tell their stories centered on heritage, joy, and beauty. They carry AAPI-owned and founded brands like Live Tinted, Peach and Lily, Glamnetic, Tree Hut, and more. Shop AAPI-owned and founded brands at Ulta Beauty stores and Ulta.com. 